Jonah chapter 2. Continuing our study of a fish tale. <coughs> the Prussian king Frederick the Great went down to the prison in Berlin one time and was just touring it. He was more inspecting the guards, I think, than paying attention to the prisoners. But uh, as he went by, every one of the prisoners would fall on their knees and shout out, I'm innocent, I'm, I'm not guilty, let me go, pardon me, send me send me out of here. And then finally, he came to one man who remained silent, so the king approached him and said, well, why are you here? He said, armed robbery, your majesty. He said, are you guilty? Yes, indeed, your majesty, I deserve my punishment, so I, I didn't ask for anything. Frederick the Great then summoned the jailer immediately and said, release this guilty wretch at once. I don't want him contaminating all these other innocent people with his guilt. Admitting guilt's hard to do. There's not a lot of people that are guilty. My time as a municipal court judge showed me that. There's not a lot of people who are guilty come in and say, yes, I'm guilty. Nobody approached me and said, yes, I was speedy. But one person. And she had a real creative excuse. So she got minimum fine and got to get out of there. But really, we, we tend to want to justify ourselves. If you've been a parent, you've seen this. How many times when you're about to get on to your children, do they immediately say, yes, I know I was wrong, I know I was guilty, I, or they immediately try to justify their action? You can watch them do something wrong, and they'll tell them why they thought it was right because of what someone else did. I wish I had a dollar already for how many times I've told children, don't try to justify your bad actions by telling me somebody else's bad actions. Because they, they tend to want to do that. That's human nature. And that's kind of where we're at in, in this our study of, of a fish tale. We're looking at the prophet Jonah. And today we're looking in chapter 2. Last week in chapter 1, God called Jonah, who was a prophet, to go down to Nineveh and there proclaim a message to warn them that judgment was falling. And Jonah didn't do that. Jonah decided to go the opposite way. He decided to run away for fear, out of rebellion, whatever reason, Jonah decided to run the other way. And a storm came up, and the storm was so bad, they threw all the cargo overboard. Finally, they cast lots, found it was Jonah who was guilty. He confessed then that it was his fault. He was running for God, so they threw him into the ocean. And somewhere, and then a fish swallows him. It says a fish. In the Bible, in the Hebrew back then, it was before taxonomy. Somebody pointed out that's not a fish's tail. It's kind of a play on words. Yes, that is a whale's tail, but they didn't have a separate word for whale or fish. Which is why there's been so much confusion over all the years. Did a whale or a fish? It didn't matter what it was. It wasn't natural. God had made it to where Jonah gets in the belly but doesn't digest. And he's hanging out there with the, in the fish guts. And then he's there three days and nights. Somewhere between chapter 1 and chapter 2, Jonah becomes the penitent prophet. Because chapter 2, as we begin today and look at chapter 2, it's really not totally a prayer of confession. It's a prayer of thanksgiving for the deliverance after he confessed. I don't know when, probably in my mind, I would have started confessing as they were throwing me over the board, over the ship and asked God to help me. Maybe he waited until the fish was about to swallow him. You know, maybe he saw the fish coming at him like Jaws about to get him and that's when he decided to confess. Or maybe after a day or two inside the fish stomach, then he confessed. But somewhere along the way, he confesses and his attitude does a complete 180. Which is what penitents, or, or as we would say today, repentance. For penitent, we have repented. It's what repentance is about. It's about turning around. Jonah now was ready to, to get things right with God. As we look at his prayer of deliverance, of thanksgiving there, I want us to, to learn some lessons in our life today because one of the things to understand, one of the reasons why this story always kind of hits home with all of us when we study it, is we've all been sinners. We've all rebelled against God. We're all going to have sin to deal with. There's always going to be a point that you and I will have to repent. It may be over what we would see as a very little thing. Maybe a slow drift or a slow fade. Maybe it's over a real big thing. The point is though that God is always still in the in the ministry of delivering us when we do repent. And that's what we really want to hold on to. And as we go through these points, I want us to really... It's, I hope it's a message of hope. 
I did this under the influence of drugs earlier in the week, and then I cleaned it up at the end of the week, so hopefully it's, it's better today, because I'm not on, on the pain pills I was when I first started doing this on Monday, but hopefully the Lord has made this a message of hope, because even when we see sin, what we as Christians have to get the message out is there's always hope. We're not here. We've got a bad reputation as Christians. That all we do is tell people what not to do. All we do is condemn people. All we do is judge people is the word they like to use. All we do is criticize. What we really are doing is calling them to repent. We're offering them hope. And today, if you're in the middle of sin right now, we're offering you hope to recognize it's not too late. You can turn around. You can be blessed by God and go on and do great things for God. Let's stand as we read God's Word in Jonah chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly, and said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I've been cast out of your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The water surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed, salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> Did you see how far Jonah felt like he had slipped? He went down to basically to the bottom of the ocean. Seaweeds were wrapping around his head. And, and he, 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 he basically felt it was all over. And then he remembered God and cried out to God. And I want us to see a few things about this today. First of all, the, the first thing I want to point out it is it isn't too late. It's never really going to be too late. As long as you have life, it's not too late to repent. He, he was sinking down. He was in the fish. He was in his distress. And he called out to God. The tone of this prayer, like I said, is one of thanksgiving for God's deliverance. This is him, after he's repented, thanking God for the forgiveness. And thanking God that he's still alive. Thanking God that he's still on this planet. And I don't know yet how long of a life expectancy he had just from these first few verses. But the tone is as one of gratitude. He believed himself to basically be ending. He believed his life to be over. That he was drowning that he was going to sink down to the depths and be done, but he called out to the only one who could save him. In his last moment of life, he cried out for deliverance. We've all heard about those deathbed confessions. We've all heard about those people who know they're about to die. A lot of times, then they'll call for the preacher and, and, and they'll, through witnessing, they'll cry out and get saved. And people often wonder, well, is that legitimate or not? As far as timing goes... It's never a point that it's too late as long as they're still alive. You can say, but wait a minute. This doesn't line up. In Romans, it talks about God gives people over to a reprobate mind. Well, let, let me clarify that. Yes, there is a point that God says, I will no longer convict you. You've seared your conscience. I'm not going to keep calling you. But if God's given that person over to that point, they're never going to ask to get saved. I once had a man say that he would get saved if only he could. He would, he would love to get saved. He wants to get saved. He said, but, but he heard that verse in Romans as a way to shut off the preachers talking to him. He said, but God's given me up to reprobate mine. I can't get saved even though I want to. I called him a liar. I did it in a flat way. But if you really want to be saved, if you really want God in your life, you haven't been seared to the point that He's turned you over to that reprobate mind. That's the person that's going down life's road so far from God Basically, they've turned off the voice of God. They can't even hear it anymore. And that's reserved for... You look at that list, that's reserved for some of the, the people that are so deep in their sins. There is that point. 
that it's too late for individuals to be saved. But today, if you're sitting here grieving over your sin, you're sitting here knowing the catastrophe your life has become is due to your sin, and you wish you could do something about it, that's God saying you can do something about it. And it's, don't try to use that cop out. I think he'd really, he'd learned that that would shut a lot of preachers up. Well, I just, I can't. I can't get saved. I said, okay, I won't try. To me, I said, no, if there's none that seeks after God, no, not one. If you still want to, you still can, is the way I looked at it there. It's not too late. After getting in the fish, he thanks God for deliverance. He, he didn't forget this unconventional form of rescue. In those fish's guts, he has a praise service. We've heard in the New Testament, Paul and Silas worshiping in a jail cell, but this guy's worshiping in a, in a possibly a well's gut. He's there worshiping God. He's there giving praise to God for his deliverance that God hadn't forgotten him there. I want to I want to point this out. Today we can pray anytime and anywhere, and God will hear us. Don't think it's too late to turn to God. Don't think I'm too sick to ask God for help. Don't think I've gone too far. I'm too sinful. It's too late. I've done too many things. It's too late for me. It's not too late. If you hear the sound of my voice and God's Spirit's pricking your heart and burdening you and, and convicting you, it's not too late. Things can be changed. We have to understand that. As long as we have breath, we can go to God. I think of Daniel in Babylon. Daniel was there as a young man was taken down and he'd gone through several tests of his faith and he'd stayed pure to God. And his Hebrew friends had stayed pure to God and late in his life, he's there. And he, he was reading Jeremiah and read how Israel was supposed to be in captivity for 70 years. And Daniel said, wait a minute, he did the math, it's been about 70 years that Judah's been down here in captivity. So he prayed to God and started asking God about these things. This is over later in the book of Daniel. And, and what's really, really interesting, Daniel's in a, a Babylon. He's in a pagan society. He's there. It says that God immediately sent Gabriel to answer him. But if you remember the story, it took about a month or so to get there. Gabriel, when he finally gets through to, to Daniel, says... The minute you started praying, God heard your prayer and sent me. But Gabriel had to fight with the, the prince of Persia, the one that was kind of over that area. That sounds like a demon over that area. Some say maybe it was Satan himself. Some say it was just another high-ranking demon. He couldn't beat him, so he had to go back to heaven and get Michael to come back. And Michael had to wrestle and fight with him so Gabriel could slip on through and give this message to Daniel. What I like about that story, what, what struck me as I was thinking about that this week, the minute Daniel started praying, even behind these enemy lines, where there's a big, massive demon over the area, with strong control that even an archangel couldn't beat him by himself, the minute he started praying, God heard it. God will always hear our prayers. You may think it's too late, but if you cry out to God, He will hear that prayer. It's not too late. You aren't in a spot He can't hear it. He hears it. The answer may take a little while to get here. But there's no time that we can't pray. Even with our last breath. I, I, those, those deathbed confessions, basically they're up to God. If they're sincere and have faith in God, I fully believe that we're going to see Him in heaven. There's an example in the Bible. The thief on the cross next to Jesus. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What was Jesus' reply? Today you'll be with me in paradise. It doesn't get more deathbed than when you're hanging on the cross being crucified next to Jesus. He knows his life is short. He knows it's a matter of mere moments. And it, he was able to repent and Jesus said, yes, I'll take you to heaven. With our last breath, we can pray. When, you know, there's just a general lesson in, in, about prayer. It, we need to just pray even in good times. Whether we've got anything to confess this moment or not, we need to just pray. And it's, it's never too late to pray. But we always need to understand, we need to, to go to God. Jonah had somehow, I don't know exactly where, doesn't say here in this chapter, this is the praise service after the forgiveness. But Jonah had understood the secret of finding that restore, restoration of that relationship with God. He knew, even before John had written this in 1 John 1, 8-10, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins 
and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we do not have any sin, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Jonah had confessed his sin. Jonah had cried out to God. This is a psalm praising God for forgiving him. So that tells us Jonah had to have confessed that sin. And that's what we have to do. When we recognize sin in our life, confess it. God calls us to repent, to to turn away from it. And we do that just by agreeing with Him. Going to Him in prayer and saying, I'm sorry, I want to change. Asking His help to change. We have to understand though, all of us sin. Before we criticize Jonah too much, before we look at other people in the Bible and attack them and talk about how bad they were and the horrible choices, before we look at the world out there, we need to take and look in the mirror. Because we have sin. All of us, we've got a sin nature, and we all commit sin. Some of our sins may be the same, some of our sins may be different than each other, but we all sin. Given the right set of circumstances, I asked you last week to think about the place that scared you the most if God sent you to witness to those people. And some of you shared with me some of the places you thought of later. Folks, think about it. Given the right circumstances, you too might drive the opposite direction. It'd be a challenge. Given the right circumstances, we could do exactly what everybody in the Bible did. If we're not careful, we need to make sure we understand it. Let's not get the sinful with pride this morning. When we sin, we have to deal with it. It's not that we sin or not. We're going to sin. It's what you do with it. If we hold on to it, if we live in it, if we make it our identification mark, then we're going to start seeing the judgment of God. We're going to start seeing the storm we talked about last week. We're going to start seeing the fish waiting to swallow us up. God's going to start sending chastisement our way. If we confess it, He forgives it. I can't totally understand that. Why He keeps choosing to forgive me over and over and over. It's a love thing. It's a grace thing. Do I deserve it? No. But I'm sure glad He loves me that much. And that's the thing to understand because He should zap us when we sin. He should should beat us up like we do ourselves over sin. He shouldn't take us back over and over and over. But His grace is sufficient. His love covers it all. The Bible says He takes our sin and He removes it as far from us as the east is from the west. He takes it, puts it into the depths of the sea where no one can reach. He takes our sin and totally removes it from us. Every time we sin and confess, He takes it away. I I don't get it. That's one of those things, that's a God thing. That's His divine grace, His choice to love us that much to keep forgiving our sins. I, 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 I would have given up on the nation of Israel many times. I'd have given up on me many times. Sometimes we give up on each other too frequently, unfortunately. But God doesn't. He never gives up on us. It's not too late. Unfortunately, many people choose the wrong path. When they sin, they try to ignore it. They try to ignore it. Maybe it just go away. Back like it didn't happen. They try to cover it up, maybe. Sometimes they try to rationalize it. They justify it like those kids we talked about earlier. They, 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 well, it wasn't sin because they had a reason. It's called situational ethics. It seems to be what rules most people today. That there is no right and wrong. It's whatever the situation requires that makes it right. And under that circumstance, there's a way to rationalize murder. If it makes it right, if I have to kill you to accomplish a better end down the road, you know, that, that's just, to me, that's crazy thinking. There is a right and wrong. God has established that. Most people, when you think about it and apply situational ethics to the point of murder, the majority of people would say, yeah, that's still wrong anyway. That kind of breaks down their argument when you go to that point. But God doesn't care about our rationalization. God set the standard for us. The one and only thing we need to do is confess it. This is the time. The minute the Spirit convicts you of it, confess it. Maybe you didn't know it was sin. Maybe suddenly reading the Bible... That's why I encourage you to read the Bible and study the Bible. It's what we do for Sunday school and Wednesday night study. We try to dig into the Bible a little more. You're sitting here and suddenly you feel like I'm stepping on your toes. It's not me, it's God's Word. If you see see a sin, God brings a sin to mind, stop and confess that. Even right now, you can bow and confess to God your sin because it's always the appropriate time. 
Confession has been defined by some as agreeing with God. Just agreeing with God's perspective that you've sinned. Now is the time. Don't wait. But always remember, it's never going to be too late. The next thing I want to look at is we haven't fallen too far. I think Jonah acknowledged in verse 3-6 through six, he was being punished justly. I mean, he says, God had cast him into the deep. Your billows and your waves passed over me. He said, I've been cast out from your sight. Jonah, I think, understood. The minute he stood on the boat, he confessed to those men. I think he understood. Yeah, I've messed up. It's my fault. The storm's here for me. Throw me overboard, you get spared. But I think here he, he sees and acknowledges he was in trouble and was sinking in, in God's judgment. Verse 6, he said, I sank to the foundation of the mountains of the earth with its prison bars closed behind me forever. But you raised my life from the pit, Lord my God. He knew what trouble was on him and he knew the source of it was the judgment of God. He, he didn't hide that. He didn't explain it away. We talked about that a lot last week, so I'm not going to go too deeply back into this point. But he knew he had fallen away from following God. He knew that he was going the wrong direction. And in the depths of the ocean, he might have said, well, it's too late now. I've gone too far. But he still looked to God. And he still looked at God. He had the right attitude. And he dealt with his sin. Even as he was thrown overboard, he realized, I haven't gone too far. I haven't fallen too far. One of the great things about the Bible, I, I heard a Tony Evans did a series, and I'm not going to buy his series, but it's got me thinking, and who knows, we may end up preaching something similar in the near future. But he did, he did one on second chances. Look at the Bible and the stories there that people get second chances. Jonah's one of the big second chance stories. Like I said last week when we started, this is not an unfamiliar story. If you've ever, ever attended Sunday school, you've probably heard Jonah. If you've ever attended church, you've heard Jonah. A lot of the world knows the story of Jonah. Sometimes they laugh about it. The idea that somebody survives in a fish for three days. Even scoffers know the story of Jonah. But to me, Jonah's a great second chance story, isn't it? Because next week we'll look at chapter 3 when he gets told a second time to go to Nineveh. And we'll see what happens after that. God gave people second chances. Moses was a murderer. Moses killed an Egyptian. And it wasn't God's timing, it wasn't God's path. He hadn't been told to kill one, and he runs away. And then at 80 years old, God calls Moses to go back and deliver the people of Israel. This time with just a stick, it turns into a snake. And mighty, mighty prayers. David committed adultery. Had the husband of the woman killed after she was pregnant, and he wouldn't go home with her. And, and then married her. And yet God still used him. On and on we could go. Saul persecuted the church. He was out to kill the Christian movement when it was just beginning. The first church of Jerusalem was just starting to spread churches out other places. And Saul was going to Damascus to arrest them, bring them back, and let them stand trial when God saved him and turned him completely around, renamed him, called him Paul then, and he went on and started planting churches. He did the opposite of what it was. The Bible is filled with second chances and sometimes third and fourth. Aren't you grateful that God does that for us? We haven't fallen too far. God keeps giving us more chances. Again, that's a grace thing. We look at each other, you know, we think of baseball. Three strikes, you're out. You know, you messed up two or three times. Nah, I'll never trust you again. God doesn't do that. You've never fallen too far. God says, I like that old song, God bring me the broken pieces and He'll put them back together. Pick up the broken pieces and take them to the Lord. When our lives are shattered, God puts them back together. It doesn't matter how many times He's had to do it before. Not because He's weak on our sin. Don't ever misunderstand that. It's because He's strong in His grace. His love is so strong, He never quits loving us. No matter what we've done. No matter how many times we've messed up, no matter how deep in sin we may have gotten. We all love a comeback story, don't we? We love listening to preachers that, that used to be out there and robbing banks, and they come in and they, they, they've been changed. We, we all like those big repentance stories. The thing is, God likes that too. And it doesn't have to be what we would see as big. 
You told one lie this last week, and that was your only sin, and you repent of it this morning. God's just as happy over that as He is over a bank robber getting saved. God loves to see us come back to Him. God loves to forgive us because His grace is so big. His grace is so strong. The natural reaction we have to hearing this is, but you just don't know. You don't know how bad I've been. You don't know what I think inside. You you don't know what I've done in my past. You, You just can't understand it. The problem is, when we say that, we're really revealing we don't know how great God is. It's not about how bad we are. Our badness can never overcome God's greatness and His goodness. Our, our, our evil that we might ever imagine and do. And it, we can think of some really bad people. There have been people in history. I'd rank Hitler up there pretty in one of the top as far as the most evil guys around if there's a contest. But God's grace is good enough that if Hitler had repented, God could have forgiven him. Because God's grace is that big. We draw these lines. We think about some people that's done certain crimes that no, can't forgive them. God says it doesn't matter. I could forgive it all. And sometimes we do that to make ourselves feel a lot better about the sin we have. The problem with that whole system we've got going is it's about me comparing myself to somebody else. God never compares me to Billy Graham or Andy Stanley or, or Chuck Swindoll or, or to Hitler or Charles Manson. God compares me one place. His Word. Did I do what He said to do? Did I not do the things He said don't do? God doesn't compare us to other people and say, oh, you're pretty good. You're better than that person. God says, you sin. Repent. The thing we've got to understand is Jesus' death is sufficient to pay for every sin that ever has been or ever will be committed on this planet or any other planet we may find ourselves one day. If we go colonize Mars, they're going to sin on Mars because human beings are sinners and Jesus' death is good for everybody born on Mars. Then there really will be Martians. He can save all them too. Wherever we go in this whole wide universe, we're going to carry sin with us because it's part of our DNA. And Jesus' blood is sufficient for it. If it's 10,000 years, Jesus' blood is good to cover all that. If it's 10 million years from now before the end comes, Jesus' death was good enough for every sin of every human being. We limit God sometimes in our minds. And a lot of it has to do with, really, I I don't know, maybe we just don't get a big enough idea of Him. Or maybe it's that we're trying to still like to say, I'm better than that person, and we're doing these little false comparisons. We need to understand, all the lost can be saved. Even that group from last week that you're a Nineveh. The ones we fear the most, they can be saved. If they're saved, they can return from that backslidden state and start following Him again. They can be saved. They haven't fallen too far. It's not about how far they've fallen, you see. It's about the One who died on the cross to pay for their sins. That's what we have to understand. All the backslidden can be revived. As a child of God, God God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Nothing can separate us from His love. John 3.16 says we believe we have eternal life. There's a lot of passages that talks about we'll never lose our, our, our salvation. But there's a lot of passages that say we're going to face the chastisement of God and even that we can commit a sin unto death. And He'll end up pulling us out of planet earth and taking us to heaven instead of letting us sin to the point. That's, they're not saying there's no consequences of sin. But eternal in my mind means eternal. But the thing is this, no matter how deep in sin we get, no matter how far out in the consequences we are, we haven't gone too far for God's forgiveness to reach us. We haven't gone too far. God still will love us and still take us back. And when He does that, we can be turned around. We haven't fallen too far. Today we have to understand that. And then like, just from this whole passage of Jonah, we have a future. Jonah over and over Talks about his future. And think about this. I know he's a prophet. He gets to foretell the future sometimes. But I think it showed his his faith that he had. He's in the belly of a fish. If you find yourself in that circumstance this week, what do you expect to happen? Imminent death. 
You expect to be digested. If you survive the swallowing, you don't expect to survive very long. Okay? And then no offense to those going to the beach. I'm not trying to scare you, but you know. That's what you expect in the belly of a fish. But notice what Jonah says here later in this passage. As my life was fading away, I remembered Yahweh. My prayer came to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to, to worthless idols forsake faithful love. But as for me, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill the vows that I vowed. Salvation is from the Lord. Think about it. In the fish, he says, I'm going to sacrifice to you, God. I'm going to fulfill my vows. I, I read into that, and maybe I'm wrong, but as I studied this, I read into that, he's renewing his commitment. He's renewing his commitment to God. I will sacrifice again. Where did you sacrifice? Jerusalem, right? In the belly of the fish, in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, he says, I'm going to sacrifice back in Jerusalem. He had faith. He knew and had experienced God's forgiveness, so he knew he would sacrifice back in Jerusalem. And I don't know what vows, but he had made some vows. We're good at making vows when we get in trouble, aren't we? God, if you'll only do this, then I'll do this. I'll attend church every Sunday, God, if you get me through this crisis I'm in. If you get me off this trouble, then God will do this, God. We're, we're good at bargaining with God when the crisis hits. I don't know if Jonah had done that or not, but somewhere in here he made a vow to God. And he said, I will fulfill them. This is me talking, it's not in the Bible here, but I think one of the vows may have been one he had taken several years before when he said, I will speak for you when he became a prophet. God had called him to deliver his message. And a prophet's ministry is a lot like a preacher. It's a lot like what we have today. We're supposed to represent God to the people. In the Old Testament, it was, it was one tribe and one family from within that tribe that became the priest. And then just a few people scattered out that were called to be prophets. It was a rare thing. In the New Testament, it says we're all priests. We have all am, are ambassadors of Christ. We've all got that mission of representing God to the world around us. And so I think, in my mind, Jonah was renewing that vow, I'll go back to speaking for you. I, I went to school with a lot of, at Jacksonville College, with a lot of young preachers. We, 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 we had classes, exciting classes like denominational practices and pastoral activities. You know, classes only a young preacher is going to take because they know they're going to use it later. And uh, we all had these big dreams and everybody's going to be pastoring big churches and everybody's going to be doing all these big things. And I look around and one of the greatest speakers from our group, from there and then from seminary, now is real good at selling insurance and, and, and uh, managing other people in the insurance industry. One of them uh, was a manager in a bookstore for a while and now has moved on to something else. But, you know, I look and, and a lot of them. One of them is going to start a, a new church down in the Austin area and just going to be big. Going to, exciting missions work isn't to be found anywhere now walking in the faith. There, there's so many that get tired and they, they fall back and they forget that. So many that have taught Sunday school for years and say, well, I'm tired. I don't want to do it anymore. And they try to stop. So many that maybe have led singing, then they, then they quit. They even quit coming to church a lot of times. We need to renew our vows like Jonah did. And say, God, I'll, I'll do what you say. We have a future. It doesn't matter what our past is. We have a future where we can serve God. We aren't disqualified from serving God. Now, I love how God had calmed the storm. He had the fish swallow him, and then now finally the fish vomits him out. Probably a blessing Jonah didn't ask for. You know, but there really wasn't any, any good way to get him out of the fish, I don't guess. God has him vomited up on the shore, and Jonah's now delivered. I don't know, but if anybody ever kissed dry land, he probably kissed the dirt when he got to that beach. I don't know, but I, I could see that in my mind. Covered in fish food and half decayed stuff, and seaweed, he probably started kissing that ground. We'll talk about that more next week. Think about what a preacher that's going to make as he walks into Nineveh dressed that way. I hope he changes and takes a couple of showers on the way. He renews his commitment to follow God, and I want us to leave with that lesson today. God can still use us. Yes, we have a past. 
We've all sinned and fallen short of God. Most preachers have the same story I do. God called us to preach. We said, no. We said, wait. So I'll do this other thing, but don't want to pastor. We bargain with God. There, there's, we all have our sins. We all have moments we've backslidden. Some people backslide so far, they're, they're out of church altogether. Others just kind of cool off and kind of grow comfortable and don't mess with me. I'm going to sit in my spot, do my thing every Sunday, then I'll leave and just don't mess with me. I, I don't want to know anybody. I, I just want to be here. And whatever reasons it is, the thing is, we still have a future. God can still use us. Like Jonah this morning, we need to renew our commitment and keep our vows. If you've ever said, God, I surrender, I'm yours, I'll do whatever you say, I think God's going to hold us to that. If you haven't said that, you need to say that. I, there, there are some that even say, you know, they even question your salvation if you don't really recognize that He's Lord. I, I'm not going to split those hairs with you, but the point is, He is God, He is King. Whether you've said it or not, He's got the right to tell you what to do. And today we need to understand that. We need to renew our submission to God. The minute God shows us we're on the wrong path, we need to turn and get back on the right path. It's been a lot easier for Jonah. I, I don't know, but I can almost bet God said, Jonah, you better not. As he started walking the wrong way out of town, Jonah, that's not the right way. Then it was the other way. As he gets there, he's about to buy the boat. Whether it's his conscience or God's spirit, I know there had to be some hesitation as he buys passage on that ship. He probably had a lot of steps along the way. Because you know, when you and I sin, God gives us a lot of warning signals along the way, doesn't He? When we start sinning, we know maybe it's that we quit reading the Bible and God says, you better start reading. Then we start making a couple of little questionable choices. We're getting closer to the edge of danger. We've removed some guardrails like we studied on Wednesday night. We're getting closer to that danger spot. God keeps saying, you better stop. Maybe He sends a little discipline our way to try to force us back. We stay stubborn enough and ignore it long enough, we'll get over there and we'll fall off like Jonah into, into the middle of it. Full blown, go in the opposite direction. I'm rebelling against God, backslide. And then there's consequences that we're going to reap. We will reap what we've sown as we looked at last week. Once again, we need to kneel before the King and renew our fealty to Him. And know that He's not going to cast us out. You betray your country, you betray your King on earth, a lot of times after you're a traitor, there is no going to be a second chance. If you survive it, you'll spend your life in prison or some type of hard service. That's not the picture God paints for us. The picture God paints for us is found, I think, in the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son got away from his father. The prodigal son said, basically, Dad, you're dead to me. Give me my inheritance as if you just died. And for some reason, the dad does it. And the son goes off and he goes crazy. He spends it all up, as old King James said, in riotous living. He parties. He spends it up. Now he's in a foreign country. All of his so-called friends have abandoned him. He gets a job feeding pigs. Real good job for a Jewish boy. And, and basically, I don't know if he got paid anything or not. If he did, it wasn't enough to buy food because he had to eat the same stuff the pigs was eating. So his job is to slop the hogs and then to lay down next to them and eat out of that same trough. Having just had pigs at our house this last year, that's not a very pretty picture. If you've ever been around pig pens. And he realizes the slaves at my daddy's house have it better than I do out here. And he goes home expecting to be a slave. He expects like an earthly king would be. Okay, I'll take you in, but you're going to have the job feeding the hogs here. But maybe he'll have a, a bed. Or feed the sheep here. They wouldn't have hogs in a good Jewish home, would they? But what does he do? When the daddy sees him coming down the road, he runs to him and he wraps his arms around him. And he says, let's throw a party. Let's, let's kill a, a calf and let's have a, a feast. Put a ring on his finger. Put a robe on his hand because my son has come home. His son was always his son. He, he never lost that. And that's the way our Heavenly Father reacts to us when we come home. I had a moment like that when I surrendered to preach. And that's when I first heard Benny Hester's song, When God Ran. Right after I got home from surrendering to preach that Sunday night, I go into my room, turn over to a Christian radio station, that's the first song I hear talking about that story. God never says it's too late for you. As long as you're alive, it's not too late. God never says you've gone too far. 
there's always a future. If you're breathing, and if you're bothered by your sin, there's always a future. Today, let's renew our commitments to Him. Today, let's, let's, let's keep those vows we've made. Let's fulfill them. Would you bow your heads as we prepare for a time of decision?